life has not been to darkness and death, but to light and prosperity. On the 1st of June 1963, Mzee Jomo Kenyatta became the first Prime Minister of self-governing Kenya. Kenyatta has fought, fought during the many years he spent before he, 1952. Kenyatta had spent something like uh, 20 years, 25 years, partly abroad, fighting for Kenya's independence. At midnight on December the 12th, 1963, at Uhuru Stadium, amid world leaders and multitudes of people, a new nation was born. Our Kenya independence is Kenya with the law, with free laws that it has. Kenya as recognized by United Nations. That is the country he wanted. He, he was not tribal at all. And a year later, on the 12th of December, 1964, Kenya became a republic with Kenyatta as its first president. During the, the Uhuru celebrations in 1963, there was Uhuru com competition. And it happened, it just came on the 14th of December, just after the independence day. And the Prime Minister then, Kenyatta, and his wife, they were to come to this celebration on the 14th. It happened, Mrs. Kenyatta is the one who was to crown whoever is, was going to win. So lucky enough, oh, I won the Miss Uhuru contest and Mrs. Mrs. Kenyatta crowned me. And then uh, the Prime Minister was right in front there. But I was not able to greet him because after that, the National Anthem was prayed and then they left. But during the celebrations the following week, there was a reception organized by the Governor General. And uh, the Prime Minister was going to be there. So I was invited and I went. And uh, during that time, I was able to meet uh, Mze Kenyatta. And uh, I greeted him. I told him uh, where I come from. And um, I told him even I went to school with some of his relatives, Bethy Mogo, we went to Kikuyu together. And uh, he was more or less, I could see he's a bit interested. My first contact with uh, the late President Kenyatta was when I was called for interview. In the past, uh, the army commander just sent an officer there. But this time round, the president wanted to interview the officers for the position of the ADC. So I went there for interview. I was uh, number 10 in the interview, and uh, he selected me. I always remember when he asked me to read a passage in a newspaper as part of the interview. I think he just wanted to know whether I can speak English. <laughs> so he said. So that was my first contact with the president and uh, of course I was very nervous um, being an army officer, very disciplined, going before my commander in chief. Um, this was quite uh, a challenge. But I was picked and given the position to serve as an AD, given the position to serve as an ADC. When he gave responsibility, he gave, he let the person do their work. He did not interfere. Uh, if it's the ministries, he would let the ministers do their work. Uh, if it's uh, the permanent secretaries, the people he gave uh, responsibilities, he would let them do their work. Of course, with consultation, I used to see 
there was a day when uh, a lot of people from the government would come to see him. Um, but this, I would think, more is consultation than direct to directive. Kenyatta worked very hard uh, in, on, on government. In fact, I, I don't think he worked in, in anything else during his uh, tenure of office. He would come in for work always at 10 o'clock in the morning and they leave at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And during that time, at first, I would bring him a lunch, a luncheon of uh, sambusas or something else. And he was with us, sort of asking, uh, finding out what has happened. Particularly when we had to stretch time during the war in northeastern region. You, many people don't realize that it came on the doorstep of our independence. As we caught out, that place went on fire. And we worked, sometimes we would go to him to ask what we should do. I had to work very closely with foreign affairs because any, any functions going on state house, I was more or less in charge. I mean, when it is protocol side of it. But I have to work with foreign affairs because, uh, you know, the way they, they work and us, we have our own protocol. So um, every morning I have to, to see about the, who is coming, who, what are they going to eat, what are they going to drink. Make sure everything is okay. You know, social work involves that everybody is taken care of, that his guests, when he's traveling again, I have to make sure everything is up to date wherever he's going. He had a very organized program. Not everybody came to State House. We had a specific program for him and he saw people according to the times which were laid out and uh, he stuck to those programs. Of course during those times he met many heads of state and as always besides him um, and um, I helped him whenever I can and uh, I think uh, he was a great person to work for. Every Monday, he was not coming to State House Nairobi. He was working in his Katundu to see his people and to visit. But he had an office there. So every Monday I had to go to Katundu and see about the fires. So that was different now from State House, because now that is his home. I remember when Matatus were beginning, the bus companies came to Gatundu because on Mondays they would have public uh, people coming, delegations, that is. And these Matatu people, uh, bus people, said to Muse, you know now the Matatus are taking all the business. We bus companies, now we have no business. We have to close. And he told them, that's not a problem. Just sell the buses and buy Matatus. First of all, at the early stage, we didn't have state lodges. So we used to go and stay in uh, people's houses. Like uh, I remember we went to Kisumu. The first time we had to stay in uh, um, Honorable Undinga's house. He was the vice president by then, and he offered Muse to stay in his house. Then after that, we started using the PC's house, like in May, wherever we went up the country. So later we managed to establish the Mombasa State House. It was not again given to the government, it was still regional somehow, I, I couldn't understand. But um, we started uh, renovating it and we put it right. Then in Nyeri again, we had the government house, which was given by the Queen Elizabeth. And we had to, now we had to use it as a state lodge. Um, and on even Akuru, we, we started creating these state lodges.
He came to State House maybe at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, and then from there his program started. He met his people, many the various appointments. <clears throat> he had his lunch at uh, State House, and uh, on parliamentary days, he would listen to the uh, parliamentary debates from his office because he's linked uh, to Parliament. And normally at about 3.30 or 4 o'clock, he again left State House to go back to Gatuno, unless he had other special assignments. He was a very private person. That's something that uh, he did not speak much. He was a public person who, of course, was a great orator, was, was always with people out there. But in his private life, he was not a very talkative person. And that are two contrasts, which I, I, I think are very special. Maybe that's what a great leader is. He did not like um, gossips, because anything which you talk about somebody else, he will be with that somebody and call you and tell you, now tell me what you are telling me about this, this person. So you, couldn't, you can't afford to tell a lie or to cheat or to, to talk about somebody else. So he likes things to be perfect. To me, I think he was very strong. He hated to travel. He did not like to go by plane. In fact, I don't think he ever went by plane after he became president. He, was, he only went to Ethiopia because uh, Emperor Serasi Ali Selassie was a special friend to him. And I know he's the only one who made him come to make a state visit in Ethiopia. Otherwise, he never, he was saying he has too much work here, too much time has been wasted. He want to build Kenya. So he never made state visits anywhere. He would send the vice president to all the conferences. So I think he, he also did not like to travel very much. He was a very strict person. Uh, he was uh, very detailed. He wanted things done properly. And uh, he made sure uh, that what was to be done was indeed done. So I enjoyed working with him. He was firm. He was considerate. Uh, he always wanted to know about my welfare. Like whenever we went down to Mombasa, he would give me a day off or two to travel to Taita to go and see my family. At, uh, I didn't have to request. He always say, go and see your parents instead of hanging around here. He lived in Gatundu. He never lived at State House during his whole time. So I think he divided the time he saw the, during the day as his working time, and he was at State House, and evenings he spent with family, as well as weekends. Uh, I think he valued the long absence he had uh, away from the family. As you know, he had lived overseas for quite a long time when he was fighting uh, for, for the country's um, independence, liberation. Then when he returned home, uh, again, after a few years, he was arrested and put in castration and detention. So he missed family, I believe. So whenever he had uh, time to be with the family, he, he made use of that time. I, I remember like if it's Christmas, uh, important days, uh, he would spend, we would spend as family. There was also a day dedicated to family. It was known as Wakaruaya. And that day, we would be all the members uh, of the family from my father's household and from the late president's household. And that day, he presided over, and it had to take place. I remember 
remember um, the late Muse Jomo Kinyata with great fondness. In fact, he and I had a very special relationship. Um, he always referred to me as Wohikiwakwa, which basically would translate to something like my bride. Uh, but not in that manner, but you know, a special sort of um, relationship with a niece like we had. He is a family man and he had his own children. But like Uhuru, they were very young. Who was born when I was still around. And um, he couldn't, then Mrs. Kenyatta had to. So I was, uh, like Uhuru was staying in, a, in Nairobi, while Muse and Mama, they stayed in Gatundu. And uh, I had all the chance to take Uhuru to school and, uh, and his, his brother and his sister and make sure they are okay also. They are looked after in the house, next door to the state house. about him um, is his patience and um, the time he had with each individual member of the family. He took the time to listen to us, he took the time to want to know um, what we were all doing at each particular time and he listened with great patience and um, treated each one of us as individuals um, and at any one time um, you could count on him to remember uh, um, if you're having challenges, you'd always advise. And I think to me that's what was so outstanding about him. He took me as his child because as a young officer of 21, 22 years, so he took me as a child and he treated me like a child. And uh, of course, with my discipline, um, I... And in that process, I also got to work with the members of his family in many respects, and uh, we did become friends. So other than being an ADC, I did become a family friend because of my being able to work with all of them. And in any case, as an ATC, you really have no choice but to work with the family because they are always around him and you are there and you've got to be able to relate. One other thing, of course, that, um, that uh, the late Muse um, instilled with, in, in us as, as his children was hard work. And um, he emphasized this continually and said that uh, nothing in life was ever going to be free. And therefore, all the way from um, when we went to school and we started our jobs, he continually emphasized that we needed to work extremely hard and uh, realized that we needed to earn um, whatever it is that we got. There was nothing for free. President Jomo Kenyatta died on the 22nd of August 1978 at Mombasa State House. It was very difficult. It was not just difficult for the family, it was difficult for the whole country. First of all, uh, sadness engulfed the whole nation. Shops and nobody wanted to speak and it was just like whispers, whatever. And of course, when they, they saw us, members of the family, there was overpouring of grief and they would really uh, be very, very comforting. But for the family, uh, it was shock. It was, it, was, it was just disbelief. For some reason, I never saw Mze dying. You know, there are some people who are, you think they are, I contemplated his death. very strange because all Kenyatta's people are not near him when he was dying because I just happened to be, I am involved I was involved in the girl guide movement and we were going to Iran with another or with, with other ladies and now when we reached London we were I was to go to Scotland with only we caught a bus a train and we went that is the same night he had died 
But I must say, strange thing, and I'm saying now, I was shown Kenyatta's time when he died. Because I could hear him call, he called me and I looked, and then that was that. And then I noticed something happened, but I couldn't tell what. We were in a meeting with all the senior staff of Kenya, discussing the normal programs. And while we were going on with that activity, I received a phone call on my telephone. And I was informed by the head of the civil service that our head of state had departed. So the next thing I did, obviously my colleagues noticed that there was something holding me back. I asked down his telephone and I called him back on my telephone and asked him to inform me once again and he told me exactly what he had informed me that the head of state has passed away and we would like you to announce. Then at that point I informed my colleagues in the, in the, in the office. In my, at that point, we had Mr. Hassan Mazoa, controller of radio programs. We had John Wakitawa, controller of television programs. The chief engineer, at that time it was Simir Macharia. And the other heads of sections, we were just strategizing on how to improve our programs. So everything was changed. And while we were discussing, I received a confirmation, received a confirmation from the Kenya News Agency. And so we, we had enough sources to go on the air. We prepared a first announcement. And the Kiswahili version of that was read over the national radio by Hassan Mazoa. And the English version was read over the radio, the general service of the Voice of Kenya by Nobat Okare, who was a freelance newsreader. Mimi na wenzangu wengine, amoja na director wetu Bwana James Tangano wakati ule, tulikuwa tumekusha pata mafunzo katika nchi ya ngambo. Sasa mambo yale ya kitokea, jambo kama lile likitokea una huru shiku na hofu kubwa sana instinct yako vile ulivyozaliwa na mama yako na baba yako iko pale unaangalia nchi itakuwa vipi kwa sababu lolote lile utakalo disema katika kitu kinachoitwa microphone kikitoka pale ujue kinasambazwa mahali kwingi sana bila his official announcement on the national broadcast known as Voice of Kenya Today Kenya Broadcasting Corporation said Mr. Kenyatta died peacefully in his sleep on Tuesday morning. It was packaged with all other news, but naturally it came first. And all the information that was related to that was also uh, 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 brought in first. For example, we received telephone call from Canada asking us to give them an actuality of the passing away of the Kenya's head of state. So the next thing is we had nothing really to rely on apart from a phonograph and a telephone. So as we received the telephone, we played the photograph and the previous bulletin from the first announcement, we recorded it on the telephone. They recorded it on the telephone and that was actually to which an hour after, we monitored Canada and it had also gone on the air as we had prepared it. So there were certain things that kept us together. And after a while, uh, we, we worked until not 11 o'clock at night. Sometimes we received telephones, people were, and they said, yes, we are still here. It was like as if the, 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 the voice of Kenya was the one directing the hearing and the thinking of the general.
public. So we moved to State House. I stayed in State House with uh, Mama Gina and some other members of the family the whole morning period. The saddest moments, of course, was him lying there in state and having, we had to stand to be near to receive the people. So you, it's a mixture of two things. You, you are feeling very sad and yet uh, you can, you have also to be like host to the ministers. Everybody came to, to, to pay their respect. So many people came to view his body, which was put here at the State House. So we had to make everything look normal. I admire also the President Moi, also, he was always around and was making sure things are going on well. Nothing remained. I always say, I saw things moving on. We know we have lost a leader, but things went on. So we spent uh, several days there, and the final day, we took his body to Gatondo and of course now going the whole route to Gatondo there, there were very many tears and people just wailing on the road. arrived at Katundu was even more, it was just a sea of people. And he lay in state again, he stayed for the night. There was an issue, there was the major committee that was run by the government itself, and how the burial would go, and they were discussing all the things that would come in, and everything. We did not announce those arrangements until they were complete. But whenever other people wanted to know what was going on, we would check that information and say, how shall we deal with this? We were asking now the officials within the government, how do we allow reports from outside if others are reporting, said we will give that which we have done. But others coming from outside, they also want to know for their own reading. I remember very well, for example, uh, from the United States, when Andrew Young came and many others came in, um, there were questions as to whether we should give them full coverages in our situation. We had um, uh, Idi Amin who came to the funeral itself and all these other people came. Our cameras were open, but it was the cameras showing the people and we directing how it would, it would best put on the air. And a lot of uh, messages of condolences from our own politicians and citizens, and that we put on the air. It, it was an incredible uh, kind of feeling. For instance, uh, when there was the viewing of the body at State House, I remember one of my senior announcers calling me in my office because I was at the office looking at a monitor and listening. And he says, now we have... Uh, there was a kind of a fracas, a very prominent politician. He's in line also coming to pay his, uh, his respect. I said, the camera stays on. It's not you saying it, it is the, what the camera is showing. And that's how it went. The thing was so unusually, but we needed to, everybody knew what the policies are. We are reflecting the truth. We are not putting exaggeration. We are not giving individual opinions. And that's, that's how we did it. During his tenure, Kenya enjoyed political stability and economic progress. 
It was in 1974 that he declared free primary education up to primary grade four. My leadership has not been to darkness and, 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 and death, but to light and prosperity. And that is, during my time, I have um, altogether uh, managed and built over 300 schools paid and uh, controlled, financed, by my people, and uh, that, that was not uh, putting my people or leading my people to, dark and, uh, to darkness and death. He will also be remembered for urging Kenyans to preserve their culture and heritage. <laughs> Kwa na majimba wa uru